Welcome to the Carnegie Council. Today for our public affairs programs, we welcome James Rickards, author of Currency Wars. What is a currency war? We're going to be talking about currency wars, and uh, I think we're living through one. Uh, but what is a currency war? It's kind of uh, uh, from the beginning. Um, it's actually a fairly simple concept. It starts with uh, an insufficient, insufficient growth. When the world economy is at a point where there's not enough growth to go around. When, when there's a, a lot of growth or economies are growing robustly, uh, people don't care as much about the exchange rate. They, they always think about it. It's always an element of policy. But if there's kind of enough to, uh, growth to go around, you don't care as much. But when the growth is insufficient, the temptation to steal growth from your trading partners by devaluing your currency uh, becomes overwhelming. And that's really the, the origin of a currency war. And, and the way it works is uh, very straightforward. The um, U.S. has a lot of great uh, exports available to the world. Uh, take Boeing aircraft as an example. Um, you know, they make a fine plane, but there are a couple of competitors around the world. We have Airbus in Europe. We have Embraer in Brazil. Uh, China's developing an aircraft industry. Uh, so let's say you're a country like Indonesia. Uh, you need airplanes, but you don't have an indigenous aircraft industry, so you're going to go shopping around the world. I compare it to living in a small town. There are four stores. They all sort of sell the same thing. If one of those stores has a half-off sale, everyone's going to go to that store. So when you cheapen your currency, you make your stuff uh, less expensive for foreign buyers. And in theory, they're going to buy your aircraft before they buy something from Airbus. Uh, that creates exports. That contributes to growth in the United States, uh, creates jobs. Uh, given the fact that we have a serious unemployment problem and insufficient growth in this country, if a program can uh, create jobs and uh, create growth, uh, that sounds great. I mean, what's, uh, what's wrong with that? Uh, and that's the way a lot of politicians and policymakers look at it. Uh, and um, that's, that's how uh, this process of devaluing the currency begins. The problem is there are a lot of things wrong with it. Um, they, they, they end very badly, very quickly for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, the obvious fact that the United States imports more than we export. So sure, our exports might be a little bit cheaper at the margin. We might sell a few more planes and Microsoft software and Hollywood films. But we import an enormous amount, all those iPads and iPods and flat screen TVs and German cars and foreign vacations and uh, a lot of other uh, more basic um, inputs to the supply chain as well. Uh, the price of those will go up. Uh, and since we import more than we export, that actually is a way of importing inflation and price increases uh, into the United States. That then begins to feed through the uh, supply chain. Now, this is, of course, we'll talk more about it, but this is exactly what happened in the uh, 1970s. Uh, after President Nixon cheapened the dollar in 1971, we set out on one of the worst periods of inflation, bordering on hyperinflation in US history between 1977 and 1981. Cumulative inflation over the five years was 50% 5 -0. It means the value of the dollar was cut in half. So that's one of the consequences of, uh, of cheapening your currency and launching a currency war. The other one, which we saw more illustrative, I think, in the 1930s, is retaliation. Uh, if the U.S. could act in a vacuum, if we were the only country pursuing a policy, uh, this might work for a short period of time. Uh, but sooner than later, and in, in today's world, uh, almost instantaneously, other countries will begin to try to cheapen their currencies. Or if they lack the sort of economic muscle to, to be able to do that, I think Brazil is a good example of this, they'll do other things. They'll put on capital controls. Uh, they come in a lot of different flavors. You know, you invest in the in the country. They say, well, no more 30-day bank deposits. It's you know six months or a year. Or uh, we've even seen things like negative interest rates. So we're seeing capital controls in Switzerland, Brazil, uh, Thailand, South Korea, and some other countries around the world. Uh, and then the third problem, uh, in addition to uh, importing inflation and inducing capital controls, is that currency wars quickly morph into trade wars. Uh, so countries will begin to put on import uh, excise taxes. Uh, throw up other barriers to trade uh, that actually reduce world trade uh, and world economic output. And of course, that's what we saw in the 1930s. So that, that's what a currency war is. That's how uh, it's a simple temptation to steal growth from your neighbors by uh, cheapening your currency, uh, lowering uh, the cost of your exports. Uh, it has all these uh, bad negative consequences, feedback loops I described. Uh, so that's kind of it in a nutshell. There is not a military in the world that can stand up to the United States toe-to-toe. Uh, -to -toe. Some are stronger than others. Some pose different challenges. But at the end of the day, uh, there's not a Navy we can't disable. There's not an Air Force we can't suppress. There's not a command and control structure that we can't disrupt uh, at some level. 
uh, and other countries know this. Uh, and therefore, if you want to rival the United States, if you want to be an adversary of the United States, the trend is to think in terms of what we call unrestricted warfare or asymmetric warfare. Now, some of this uh, is well known, chemical, biolog biological, radiological weapons, weapons of mass destruction. But the other equally powerful, maybe even more powerful weapons are cyber warfare. Uh, and now the new kid on the block is financial warfare. Uh, and so these are all being incorporated into strategic doctrine, and not just the United States. Uh, in the book, we uh, cite various um, Chinese uh, documents and studies that explicitly make financial warfare part of uh, Chinese strategic doctrine. Um, but it's actually happening uh, as we speak in Iran. Um, the United States has been ratcheting up sanctions against Iran for years. Uh, actually, these sanctions go back to the 1980s. Uh, but most recently, uh, the president went for the jugular. He cut the Iranian central bank, uh, bank, Bank Marchese, out of the global financial system. And the way we do this is we say to all the other banks, if you do business with Bank Marchese, you may not do business in the United States. Well, considering whether it's Deutsche Bank, UBS, Commerce Bank, Credit Suisse, uh, they don't need to be told twice. The U.S. is dead serious about this. They've got enormous operations. Uh, in the United States, actually larger than in their home countries in some instances. So they immediately cut uh, Bank Marchese out of their list of counterparties. This call caused an, an instantaneous one-day drop in the value of the real, the Iranian currency, of 40%. Their currency dropped 40% in a single day against our currency. What happened next could also have been anticipated, which is a lot of what's sold in Iran is imported, maybe smuggled through Dubai, but uh, it's imported, which means if you're an Iranian merchant, you need dollars to pay the guys on the, uh, on the creek in Dubai to smuggle your stuff over. Some of it's maybe legitimate from Germany, et cetera. Um, well, if your currency is down 40%, you need twice as many dollars. So what they did is they doubled their prices in reals. So certain goods overnight went from 200,000 reals to 400,000 reals. Now we're injecting hyperinflation into the Iranian economy. Uh, the fact that there are elections in March is interesting. We're doing this ahead of their elections. Whether this is to stir the pot, get the Green Revolution going again, uh, or create some uh, more dissent. Uh, inflation, by the way, is a very powerful motivator of popular discontent. A lot of the Arab Spring, uh, sure, was there a desire for democracy and to get rid of these dictators? Absolutely. But there was an equally strong concern about inflation spreading around the world, th you know, thanks to our uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve. Uh, and inflation was a big um, part of the Tiananmen Square. Uh, demonstrations in 1989. We all remember the paper mache Statue of Liberty, but a lot of people in that square were urban uh, workers and uh, people coming in from the countryside who were concerned about inflation. So it's a good way to destabilize a regime. Regime change is really the name of the game in Iran. Nobody wants a war, but um, if we can get a, a new uh, group in there running the country, then there might be a way through uh, this nuclear program. So this is financial warfare, clear as a bell. Uh, we, we gamed it in 2009. Um, I certainly expected to see it uh, sooner than later, but maybe not quite this soon. The Fed likes to think they're playing with the thermostat, so if the house is too cold, you dial up the heat. If the house is too warm, you dial it down. Uh, my analysis says that the capital markets are a complex, critical state system, and what they're actually playing with is more like a nuclear reactor. They're moving fuel rods and control rods and neutron generators. Uh, they think they're playing with a thermostat. They're playing with something far more dangerous. You can dial up or dial down a nuclear reactor, but if you get it a little bit wrong, you'll have a catastrophe. And in my view, what the Fed is doing with the dollar, abusing their privilege, is risking a catastrophe. And finally, in uh, the last chapter of the book, I talk about these possible outcomes. I call them the four horsemen of the dollar apocalypse. Uh, the first is fairly benign. This is a world of multiple reserve currencies. Uh, so the, right now, uh, the U.S., in, sorry, in 2000, the U.S. was 70% of global reserves. 70% of global reserves were held in U.S. dollars. Today, that number is about 60%. We've come down 10%. Imagine that number continuing to drop until it's maybe 45 or 40. The euro comes up from 25 to 35. The yuan comes in for 5% or so. And we sort of have this world of, there's nobody's the boss. We all just take each other's currencies, and there's plenty of assets, and they're all good reserve currencies. Sort of a kumbaya solution. Um, I uh, think that the problem with this, and uh, Barry Eichmann Green's a leading scholar on this point, advocate, and points out that this did happen in the 1920s where the dollar and sterling shared center stage. The problem is then we run the gold standard today. We're not. There's no anchor 
Uh, and I, I think instead of one central bank behaving badly, you'd have five or six. So I don't see that as a stable solution at all. Uh, the second solution, the one favored by elites, and when I use the word elites, uh, I'm not talking about deep, dark conspiracies. I'm talking about finance ministers, central bankers, uh, the folks you bump into if you're on the street in dollars tonight, um, and, uh, and a lot of intellectuals, uh, is the SDR. That's the special drawing right. Everyone knows that the Fed has a printing press. They can print dollars. The IMF has a printing press, too. They can print uh, SDRs, hand them out to their members. Uh, they're not backed by anything. Uh, the next time there's a financial panic, and I expect one um, sooner than later, you know, sometime in the next few years at the, at the rate we're going, uh, it will be bigger than the Fed. The Fed will not be able to reliquify the world as it did do in 2008. Uh, what you'll see instead is the IMF will reliquify re the world with SDRs. Um, so that's, that's coming. Again, it's not guesswork. Uh, there's, there's a paper on the IMF website that spells out a 10-year plan uh, to issue SDRs right down to... Uh, names of uh, potential buyers, potential sellers, uh, investable assets, dealers, uh, a calendar of issuance per year, and a clearing and settlement mechanism. So it's not my blueprint, it's the IMF, so you can go look it up, it's mentioned in the book. Um, third solution is a gold standard, um, which is a highly stabilizing. I recommend it be studied. The euro was studied for 10 years before the euro actually was issued. Uh, obviously, the, that probably wasn't long enough, but. Uh, the point is, uh, you don't go to a gold standard overnight. Uh, there's some key issues you've got to wrestle with. One is, um, uh, if every gold standard is a ratio of paper to gold, how much paper do we count? Is it M0, M1, M2? These are very different numbers. Uh, the second thing is, what's the gold backing? You talk to the gold bugs, they'll say it's 100% or nothing because we can't trust the government. Uh, but historically, that's not true. England ran a gold standard very successfully in the 19th century with about 20% gold backing for the currency in the United States. Historically, when we run the gold standard, we had about 40% gold backing. So if you have enough to stand up to the market, you don't need 100%. Third issue, who's in the club? Is it just the US? I think that's unlikely because we'd have the only currency anybody wanted. So when you include China and uh, Europe, you get different results. China has four times our money supply, but only one eighth the gold. We have 8,000 tons, they have 1,000 tons. So you dilute the gold pool when you bring them in. Uh, what the point is, depending on how you pick those variables, money supply, backing, and membership, you get very different results for the implied price of gold. And they're all in the book. Uh, the low end of the range, $3,000 an ounce. At the high end of the range, if you take M2 with ECB China and the United States with 100% backing, which I don't recommend, but if you do that, it comes to $44,000 an ounce. So uh, my estimate is $7,000 an ounce. I see that. Uh, to me, that's not some wild guess to get you know, a headline or whatever. It's just it's eighth grade math. Just look at the amount of paper money and the amount of gold and make some reasonable assumptions, and that's, that's what you get to. My fourth solution, I'll finish up in one minute, promise, is uh, uh, not a solution. My fourth scenario is chaos. Um, I actually think this is the most likely uh, because of human nature. I think combination of denial, wishful thinking, um, political expediency, short-termism, and a failure to understand the statistical properties of risk in complex systems uh, may lead to this, in which case it's not the end of the world. You'll, just, uh, you'll see the president, maybe this president or another, on TV using uh, dictatorial powers, which are the law, the International Emergency Economic Powers Act of 1977, gives the president, I think rightly so, dictatorial powers in an economic emergency. Uh, he would be able to do a host of things. Uh, I suggest uh, seizing the European gold that's downtown sending out the Palisades, uh, the Taconic Parkway to West Point. Uh, it's actually most of our goals in West Point, not Fort Knox. Um, freezing the uh, Chinese treasury bonds, not stealing them, but just saying, sorry, we'll, we'll pay as agreed, but you can't trade them or cash them in. Uh, and closing exchanges until further notice, and then studying the gold standard. Mm -hmm.